You're listening to The Dental Guys. April 10th update, CARES Act 7A and 7B. What do we know and what should we do now? Justin Goodbread and Chris Mahan joined The Dental Guys to discuss some updates. It's been a little bit since we've talked and we want to give you an update on the idle loans, as they call them now, and the PPP loans. Should you have applied already? And have you applied? Have you been approved? What to do if you have been? We asked Chris and Justin these important questions and get some clarification today on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this special episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And it continues to be a fast and furious, crazy time right now, Wes. I mean, Th- man. This is this is this, a special time, John. And we're going to be bringing you some special updates. Uh, we're kind of trying to refine these things. If you're watching this live, I encourage you to leave questions um, mm-hmm. for our special guest. There's a lot of um, opportunity right now to seek out good information, and you know that we're all about the research. I mean, the amount of reading that's going on um, yeah. behind the scenes, and you know, we talk about journals all the time, John, but this is the time to refine the information and go to the people that are actually reading the stuff, producing these things. I mean, yep. we've br- we are bringing on people, John, that are just like spot on. Right. Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation and, you know, there's a difference between, <clears throat> and we're going to get into this, but there's a difference between misinformation and then things we don't know yet. And I think that what I've really enjoyed about our guests we're going to have on today is they've been real clear from the beginning, as we've been talking with them about, these mm-hmm. are things we do know because we've actually read the primary documents. And then these are the things we don't know. And as we've been getting guidance from all these different outlets, I think what we're seeing, and I made this comment to them earlier, is it's making them look smarter and smarter all the time because the things that they've been recommending as a result of of reading and talking to people that are actually administering this, it's been great. So welcome back to Chris Mahan of Mahan & Associates and Justin Goodbread of Heritage Investors and also FinanciallySimple.com. Glad to see you guys. Glad to be here, brother. Have you aged? How many years have you aged in the last week or two? <laughs> At least 10. <laughs> Buddy, I, I crashed yesterday for the first time in many years at about three o'clock and made it to my lazy boy. And it was, it was much needed. It was, it's been a wild roller coaster. Oh yeah. Well, let's get right into it here. I mean, there's a lot, we want to pack a lot of information into a short time here for people that are really, uh, you know, trying to digest as much as they can in a short time as well. Uh, I mean, not that we have, I mean, dentists have nothing but time, right? But really in the end, we just want to get the best information out there that we can. So let's get right into the same thing that's kind of been a recurring theme over our last couple of weeks. This has been these two main loan programs, economic injury disaster loan, and what we are now calling the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program. So let's talk first about this economic injury disaster loan. I, I guess I heard one of you call it the idle, which that's the first I'd heard that <laughs> makes perfect sense. Get it. Let's get phonetic <laughs> here. Um, so what is the status? Because there's been some changes to this program. Uh, first off, is, is anyone getting funded yet? And then what are the changes that have, that have occurred over the last week or two with this? The, the underwriting actually went idle, <laughs> right? They, they, with uh, <laughs> such demand that, that SBA had, they had to put a temporary pause on, you know, issuing the funds. Um, but the SBA out of Massachusetts on 4-6 on their bulletin issued a new change to idle, which basically put a $1,000 cap per employee. So 
for and it's up to mm. ten thousand of the free granted money, right? That's the free ten thousand they're giving a small business that's not going to be taxable. That's to help sub- support them for non payroll related items. But now they're putting a <laughs> payroll related component on how much you can get of the ten thousand dollars based on employee count, right? Mm. So, for example, if you have six employees and you apply for the ten thousand. They initially stated that you would get the 10,000 and it will be a grant and be forgiven. Um, now you would get, you know, if you had six employees, you'd get 6,000. If you had 12 employees, you'd still get uh, 10,000 because it's capped at 10. And they're going to start okay. distributions, they said, this week. That means week after next, probably. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I mean, they are just bombarded <laughs> right now. Um, but even if you applied for idle and you get declined <clears throat> and you had employee counts, You'll get the you'll get the up to ten thousand even if you got declined. So everybody okay. needs to apply for idle who has not done so yet. Justin's been doing it for his clients. I've been doing it for our clients. We've been working collectively together on mutual clients um, to make sure that they get in there for the idle loans because I think the SBA, whenever they issue their final interpretation last Thursday, where it says you know if you've received idle funds up until four three, you still qualify for PPP. I think you guys saw a lot of blogs and newsletters and emails going, oh, no, I can't apply for both, right? Again, at least through our podcast and our correspondence, we've always stated that you can definitely apply for both. Mm-hmm. So, Chris, I got a question for you, buddy, because you've been tracking this more so than I have. What if somebody has applied for PPP and been approved, but they have yet to apply for IDLE? What are your thoughts on that one? My understanding is they're mutually different. Um, Again, that's my understanding. I have not run into that where it's actually, you know, this is changing daily. And that's why we get to keep having these fun podcasts, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I think they're mutually exclusive for two separate things. They've issued guidance saying that you definitely can have both loans. So I don't know why they would penalize somebody for going PPP first. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't run into that either. I just, I mean, it was a question that came up late last night with a client who was approved already for the for the PPP plan. But, and I said, well, did you apply for the idle loan? They said, no, can I do it now? I was like, I haven't asked that question to anybody. And I know that you're the wizard on this particular section of this rule. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one who hasn't thought about that question yet. So make me feel <laughs> right. smarter every time, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't and we don't but still don't know what amounts this idle loan will actually allow. I mean, we're talking about how much is a grant, right? How much would be free money basically is determined by number of employees. But we still don't know. Are they going to only a- allow that amount of loan or are they going to allow this based upon your, you know, potential damage to your business? You know, initially we had some discussions about could you go in and, you know, tap into this loan as a potential way of, of, you know, having covering capital expenses. I mean, this is a 30 year loan, pretty good situation. I mean, have you guys heard anything about that? Is that changing? Is this now being more limited to just this small amount or is there still maybe going to be money available that you can get over and above that? Yeah, it's my understanding. Get money above, above that. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it, they, they're still running on the same chassis of the 7B model, guys. Um, the difference, the modification in the bill, the CARES Act that came out was just applying this $10,000 grant to the same 7B modeling. So the same underwriting metrics is there for the disaster. Um, we can't ask for the value of that loan. And there's it's basically, if you read the rules of it, it's 50% of trailing 12, or there's a calculation now with this particular CARES, profit. Um, Now, how do you calculate the profit? Who knows anymore with the Wild West that we're dealing with? Even some of the SBA lenders, on the even on the SBA calls that I've been on, they're having troubles calculating that. So to your direct question, yeah, is you still get the loan itself, which is a 30 up to, not not always, but up to a 30-year term set in the CARES Act at a 3.75% interest rate. So we're talking cheap money at a long duration, but we can't apply for a million bucks. It's actually an internal calculation that tells us what that loan value is going to be. So let me ask you this, Justin, if you're, if you're out there and you're, you're, you haven't applied for the idle loan yet, uh, otherwise known as 7B, um, you know, what things um, should you be doing right now? Should you be applying? Should you be jumping into this pool now? Is this a good time? Yeah, you know, Chris and I have said the same guidance now for like the last decade, it seems like we've been on this journey for at least the last three weeks. We've been saying consistently, yeah, go ahead and apply now. 
Go ahead and apply now for the Idle loan, um, especially the dental community because of the circumstances. But Chris and I both have clients who are not in the dental, but in other entrepreneurial doctor positions. And we're telling pretty much everybody to apply for it because of the grant position that's now been clarified as as late as uh, last week from Massachusetts. So I think, Chris, unless you have any different opinion, I still think you still go out and apply to right now for the 7B, the idle loan. Exactly. Exactly. There's no there's no cap on how you spend the money other than you can't spend it on payroll. It's got to be for money outside of what PPP is built for. So I know that a lot of practices have had cash flow impacts and that can help you subsidize immediately some of that cash flow. Into, that's a great segue into the next and really, I think, the big part of what we want to talk about today, which is this PPP, this this huge monster that is, uh, you know, we've been trying to figure out and understand over the last few weeks. Um, I, I want to say, let's start with this of what has changed in our understanding of this over the last week to two weeks. Um, kind of where are we now? And then let's talk a little bit about some of the recommendations that have been thrown out there and just kind of how maybe wrong uh, some of those have been, not from you guys, uh, which is awesome, but uh, what, what's changed in the last week, two weeks, and where, do we, where are we now in our understanding of how this loan works and, and the funding and all of that? Chris, let me let me talk to you the kind of the flow, because I personally have gone through this, folks, and I personally have been funded on the PPP and have several clients. So two weeks is an eternity in this world. Okay. <laughs> two weeks ago, we actually had the passage of the bill. <laughs> Think about that. Two weeks ago, we had the passage of the bill and then nerds like me and Chris actually spent time with a highlighter, locked ourselves in our office and read the 800 page plus bill with the highlighter and started giving live updates saying, Hey, here's what we're reading. Knowing that the SBA candidly still has a few days left to actually roll this thing out and provide the final guidance according to the law. As of last Friday, which would have been, I think, the third from my memory, the certain banks, not all banks, but certain banks were eligible at that point to start taking applications. They were the ones who were able to use the trans system, e-trans system, before this particular system set up. Some other banks came online on Saturday. Now, they were able to take applications, but they came online on Saturday. And currently, there are many banks at this point that haven't um, they've been taking application, but they haven't been processing them for whatever reason. So last last Friday, banks began accepting applications. I had mine in uh, because one of my dearest friends works at my local bank. By the way, side note for small banks, they're rocking it out right now compared to the big and the regional banks, just FYI. But my best friend put this thing through and we were calculating calculations off a number of different areas. I mean, we, we were getting guidance at the time that you could calculate 1099 income. You could only use $100,000 or total gross income for for practitioners. I mean, it was a lot of different mis, misguided or unclarified information that candidly, the SBA was doing the best they could. They have 3,300 employees. And last year, they did 58,000 loans. Now they're getting ready to do millions, millions of loans. Um, so they were doing the best they can. They were trying to get out in front of this particular position. They told banks, yes, to go ahead and submit. And what the banks started doing instantly was trying to develop their own underwriting guidelines. And that perhaps was the most frustrating to us. Even those, even the bankers were dealing with their own internal conflicts saying, look, this loan says there is no, there is no personal guarantee and there is no collateral needed. Therefore, there's not a lot of risk to the bank. And so the banks were trying to protect themselves. I think they were still a little gun shy back from seven and eight. And they approved some things and pushed them through and other things they began. I, I would say, I wouldn't say nitpicking, but they were trying to figure out how can we validate this to our traditional CPA, banker, I would say bean counter world, right? Depending on who you were dealing with. And they did the best they could. Well, then at that point, several things got kicked back. I know in my own world, I had, I had to get on the phone and say, no, here's the law. Here's what it says. Here's the essence of the law. Now, they brought us some questions that I saw some legal guidance on. I'm not an attorney. I know we have attorneys that are going to be watching this. But what happens if you calculated your loan incorrectly? Well, the guidance wasn't out yet. And so there may be a hold harmless provision that several attorneys are talking <clears> about. So those individuals who use 1099 income, for example, and got paid and funded off of that and the banks allowed it, there may be some hold harmless. We may have to deal with that on a loan provision toward later on. So we've seen a lot of things change. We've seen a lot of things change. Mm -hmm. And here's the most frustrating part for me in the planner world today is that out of the hundreds of clients, and Chris, you probably shouldn't say the same thing, and I'll bounce it over to you. 
out of the hundreds of clients that we have the opportunity and the pleasure and the honor to serve. I mean, I genuinely mean that. I mean, we're pouring our blood, sweat and tears into in our clients. We, we would do it in, a, in a, every day of the week. The frustrating thing is that there's no uniformity across the banking world. And the banks right. are still, despite the SBA guidance that they offered on the 6th, and then Chris, you updated the one this morning on the 8th, the very first question, the very first question is, you do not have to, the answer is you do not have to validate or, or calculate the, where the numbers come from. Basically, they're trying to speed the numbers through. So it is. Mm. It says here, directly from the SBA, mm. no, provide an a, you do, providing an accurate calculation of payroll costs is a responsibility of the borrower, and the borrower attests to the accuracy of those calculations on the borrower ac- a- application form. So what the banks were trying to get during this whole time period and the frustration we're dealing with is they were CYA themselves to make sure that if this thing came back around, if the rules changed again, that they were protected. The SBA gave that guidance on the 6th and then reconfirmed that again on the 8th. So that's what I've experienced through this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And Chris, I'll bounce over to you because you have a little bit different take on some of these movements. No, again, one of the things to speak to is with the hold harmless. I did read where it said if you applied for the loan based on the criteria that the law was at that moment, you would be okay. So if you went out day one and in, included con- independent contractors, you're, there's a potential that you'd be okay with that calculation and potential forgiveness because they said that the, as this has been so dynamic and fluid in how it's moved, um, the SBA said they'll honor it as of the time that the applications were sent, you know, whatever the law or guidance was at that time. And, and Justin hit the, hit the nail on the head is every bank has a different set of criteria that they want for underwriting. When the SBA and Department of Treasury wanted this to be easy, they said based on 941s or based on, you know, or financial statements, or even if you just have bank statements that you can back this up with. And the banks had, it was a zero risk rate from day one, 100% federal guarantee, no personal collateral, no personal guarantees, but the banks are still hesitant to jump on it because they're afraid that they might get they might be issuing loans to businesses and they don't know what the economy is going to do and if these businesses fold do those loans stick on their bank's balance sheets and i get it the bank's number one responsibility is to their stakeholders to their account holders to their employees to their stockholders and until they get clarity which it's been moving so rapidly most banks aren't even submitting these there's been 70 billion of the initial 350 billion appropriated for this issued so far and I would say one tenth of the applications that have been sub- submitted to banks have probably been submitted to SBA. So there's going to be a windfall probably next week, whenever the kind of the deadline goes through for the banking regulation window. Mm. When they pass this legislation, they had 15 days to basically <laughs> adjust really how they want to, and the banks are just nervous about that. So it's not getting to the to the people that need it fast enough, right? Hey, mm. Chris, um, do you think and the people that, that need it fast enough? I'm sorry. Well, I say I was Chris. Do you think that with what Justin said and what you just said, it seems like that there are some major dental specific management and accounting firms that are struggling with this? Right? Is it why? Yeah. Why is that? Why is that happening? Well, well, you, and, and before you answer that, let me say the big thing that for dental that is really. The, the big sticking point for us is this forgiveness period. <clears throat> and let me preface that, that answer by saying, you know, a week ago when we talked, w- there was some stuff that got put out there by um, a couple of the major uh, big dental specific accounting firms that said they had heard or received information that we would be able to defer disbursement of these PPP funds for and basically choose our eight week period of forgiveness. So we could say, hey, uh, we know we're not going back to work until June. So let's go ahead and get everything to the bank. The bank will hold it and they'll go ahead and get us our money earmarked. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get the money dispersed when we're ready for it, when we're going back to work, which would be great for us because then we wouldn't be sitting here holding this money while we're not working. And this was one of the major, I mean, this was Kane Waters came out and said this. At the same time, we had McGill Advisory, another major one, talking about how you need to go get it now. And they're still saying that because they're worried about the money running out. 
So you got these two, you know, big names that are putting this information out. Now Kane Waters is backtracking saying, well, turns out maybe that won't work quite like that. And, and, and actually maybe, uh, you can't get it deferred. So, uh, hmm, now we're thinking totally differently. What is going on first off with why are these recommendations being made without understanding this? Uh, or, and then second off, what is the current understanding of the forgiveness period? Because I think everybody's really hinging everything on that. So talk a little bit about that, guys. Like, what, what's going yeah, on Chris, out there? Why are we getting this guidance? Chris, you've, you've, you're a, a healthcare-specific you know, firm. What the mm-hmm. heck, man? I mean, like, I mean, I'm glad you're <laughs> right. But what is yeah. going on, right? Because some people oh, yeah. are in some bad ways right now. Yeah, you know, and it's a... It, it, I think that, you know, I attribute all my knowledge to having good friends like Justin Goodbread because he does all the research and then I get to look at his cliff notes. But that being said. <laughs> that's good. Um, Let's give credit to the team and the coaching, right? <laughs> that's right. That's this right. is so good. But I think, I really think what happened was I think fear and anxiety, which drives most bad behavior decisions, right? Everybody saw how much money was going out and how much had been appropriated for this bill. And they thought if you don't go get your money, you're going to miss out on this deal, right? And just for note, um, Senator McConnell is going to bring to the floor for unanimous consent tomorrow for them to pass a standalone emergency funding for an additional $250 billion. They've said that they will not leave one small business at the door on this deal. Now, we all know Congress, and it might not get through tomorrow because they like to put on, they like to get their, to get their add-ons on the deal, right? But the money is coming. They are going to support small business through this. And I've been confident that they will because we're in uncharted territory. I mean, you know, everybody's bummed about sitting at home and not going to work. But we're, I mean, look at, look at World War II, right? The, the government's going to stand up and protect the citizenry. It's going to protect the businesses. And whenever the, and you look at the Dow, and whenever they see that relief and that confidence coming through, the Dow pops back up as though at 23 yesterday, right? Yeah. So, I think it's anxiety and fear. And then they may have gotten misinformation from some bankers and their interpretation with that lender saying they thought they could defer it. But the SBA's come out with clear guidelines that upon approval, the lender has to disperse. It says the first disbursement. So that's what it says. First disbursement of funds has to be made within 10 days. And then you're on that. And then as soon as it, and then you're on the eight week clock, you're on the eight week clock. And that's what you have to spend the money on um, to get it forgiven. And if you don't, then, um, you just basically took on a loan and that's where dentistry is in such a pickle right now because we're shut down and we're likely going to be the last ones that get back in. Right. Take this, for example, Austria, who's, who's their, their, they, their, their line plateaued weeks ago. They're starting to release the, um, the, the precautions they put on the citizenry starting to open up stores next week. Restaurants in Austria aren't going to open up until May 15th. So if we're on the same, and they're saying that our that we're going to plateau or flatline our or you know level off our curve in 30 days, that puts us July 15th for restaurants. And where's dentistry going to come in after that? I mean, are, are they have enough N95 masks for everybody in the dental office? They have enough, you know, HEPA air, clean air. So what are they going to do? So if you get the money er, early, you could set yourself up potentially for pay, putting your staff on payroll running out of that money and there may be provisions later that if they go like on unemployment, there may be provisions, uh, you know, again, that, that discount forgiveness there too. So you basically took out a loan, paid your staff oh. and then you just have a loan. for. So, it. <clears throat> so let me just take a, a quick little recap break here on what you said. Cause there's a lot we're unpacking in this and it's all good. Um, so first off, you're saying that there to be clear on this, that there does not appear to be, at the ability to defer the the funds. The SBA has been pretty clear about that over the last week. And if you have an individual small bank lender who says you can defer the funds, then essentially you better get that in writing from the bank on their letterhead saying that's, a, that's the case because it doesn't look like that's coming from SBA. And I specifically talked to my bank early on and they said, yes, our understanding is you might be able to defer. I didn't apply, but they were we were talking about it. And um, now I'm talking to them and they're saying, eh, yeah, we're hearing the same thing. Like we, we can't defer the disbursement. 
But there's been a ton of people as a result of that initial misinformation, as you said, that have applied. And the question is, can, what should you do? Because what I'm hearing you say is, you're, you, you guys have always had the same take here as you've read the, the documents that government is committed to this. The money isn't a guarantee, but it's most likely going to be there. It's, that's what you guys have kind of hedged on, which, I, which is so far seems to be about the right path. So the approach would be if you were to have already applied, um, maybe the information has gone out to the SBA. Maybe it hasn't. So let's talk about a strategy for people who are listening to this and they're going, this may be the first time they're hearing that they can't defer that eight weeks. So what should they do now if they're in that boat where they've already applied? First off, what do they do if they want to, can they pull that back? Is that possible? And then we'll talk about if they can't pull that back, what's the strategy for those folks? So, John, let me speak to this for a second, Chris, because I've went through this personally in the process and already been approved in this area. Um, let's let's separate the two and let's define our terms just for clarity purposes. Let's deal with application. Whenever we say that we've already applied, we first are, are we apply through the loan application, the seven A document that the that the PPP is positioned on. We've given it to our banker. That is what some people term as an application or you've applied. The key is not whether or not you've given the data to your banker, it's whether or not your banker has submitted it and submitted it to the SBA. That's the terms. It, like Chris mentioned earlier, I'm hearing and he is hearing, there's a lot of bankers who's getting the applications and just sitting on them for right now. So let's just for this point of the conversation, Chris, I'll bounce it to you after the second part. Let's say they've already been submitted to the SBA. So I'll deal with the first chapter. You deal with the second chapter here. If you have submitted your application to the bank and it has not been provided to the SBA, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you to talk to your team now. There's been a lot of guidance provided in the last week on Tuesday the 6th and then even as late as yesterday from the SBA on how the calculations are made. Whenever we we had some clients who use cash balance plans, one of my favorite tools to use for, for dentists and for high performer business owners. In, on Saturday of last week, the banks were not allowing that particular calculation. They were saying, hey, you can only use $100,000 gross. You can't use tax. Yeah, There's a lot of different things they were not allowing. The SBA came out on, on Tuesday, I think it was the 6th, and said, no, you can, have, you can use some calculations, even more benefits uh, than what you originally anticipated. So if you've submitted applications to the bank and the bank has not provided that to the SBA, I'm going to tell you to do a recalculating of your numbers because there's potential for greater forgivable loan positions than you originally anticipated. Um, go ahead as you're going through that recalculation and reach out to the planner team or the a, a CPA team, more than likely they're working together, to pull in financials, as, I'm sorry, fin, uh, financial papers as it relates to cash balance plan, profit sharing plan, safe harbor plan. If you're an S corporation that the company's making an SEP contributions on an annual basis for you, uh, HSA contributions, um, supplemental disability incomes. So if you have a group DI plan, if you have a company paid DI plan, if you have group health insurance, there's a lot of different benefits here now that many people forgot to include. And I saw a lot of these things and we're talking sizable dollars. I have one particular client who has a cash balance plan they fund with about $750,000 a year. Friends, that is almost a hundred of, if I forget the exact map, but it was like 200 grand additional forgiveness loan than what they originally applied for. And they were approved yesterday and funding will take place tomorrow. So if you've applied, in other words, you fill out an application and give it to your bank and they have not submit, submitted that yet, get it back or tell them to hold it and let's work with the, as, as John said, smart people, work with your planners, your, your accounting firms and double check the math. So I'm going to bounce it over to Chris or any other questions on that at that point. Well, and just before no, I go to Chris right. on, on, the, on his side too, is are you saying as far as the forgiveness period, if, if you have applied and you now realize you can't defer forgiveness, that's another reason to pull it back, right? Because you're going, oh, absolutely. wait, if I... If I, if, I, if I know I'm not going to be back at work for another however long, then, I mean, even if you do all these recalculations, you're still not ready to necessarily submit it until you know uh, potentially when you're going to be heading back to work. 
Yeah, and John, there there's a time and place for everything, right? Um, so we even have to dissect that. We have clients that just were not prepared for this. And they're in literal mm. survival mode at this point. And we're basically saying, no, in your case, submit it now, right? So this is not a car blanche. Okay. Hey, everybody, don't file right now. There are there are cases that Chris and I are working on jointly that we are saying, no, you are not, <clears throat> you cannot weather this storm without some additional resources. The bank's not going to give you any more money. So let's just treat this as a loan, worst case scenario, on a mm-hmm. two-year, 1% interest rate loan. So there are cases okay. that we are telling clients, add now. But the majority, okay. though, of seasoned dentists um, don't need, and that's the optimal word, they have other resources, 0% interest, credit cards, loans, lines of credit, cash in the bank, various other positions. They don't need the money. And if that's the case, as of today, I'm taking the position of a wait and see. I'm taking a position of there will be a timing. Who, who knows? We saw we saw it looked like a potential of a flattening curve on the virus in New York. as some of the reports yesterday. Mm-hmm. If that's the case, we could be, Lord help us, well, I hope we are, we could be dealing back in business in parts of the country in two and a half, three weeks from now, maybe here in East Tennessee as well. Who knows? So I'm saying take a wait and see. I'm saying that you can't take this advice or this this guidance that Chris and I are given as a blanket advice across all parties. This is where you have to be in detailed conversation with your particular case, with your particular advisors. So Chris, if you have applied and you have been approved by the SBA, and again, talking about dental specific, and maybe you thought you could defer, but it turns out you can't, because I think there's a lot of people in this boat right now as a result of some of this advice that had come out what do, you, what do you tell somebody that's in that situation right now? If they're about to get money into their bank account and they're not going to be going back to work for four to six weeks, um, what is, what's the play at this point in those, in those situations if you can't track back and wait? Well, two things. Um, you know, and Justin, you know, you've been through the process. I've submitted multiple uh, applications to bankers to submit. But after you got approved by the SBA, did you have to sign a promissory note? Um, so I close on mine tonight and the money will be there tonight. I've, I have to sign an affidavit actually is what I have to sign with my bank, basically mm-hmm. saying that I've calculated, I'm, I'm a CFP. I've calculated the, the numbers myself. I provided them all sorts of information that their numbers and my numbers don't quite align, but i I made according to the guidance that the SBA gave on the six that I made the best calculation I could with the information at that time and that it was honest and trustworthy. That was in addition to the actual SBA loan app. Now, there's a bank document, a closing document that I have to sign on my particular banks. And then the other thing they're doing, which I think is very smart, I got to figure out how practically to do this, is they're actually opening up a separate account altogether for this particular loan. Right. And saying yeah, that we want to we want you to be able to help you track that loan. Well, the practicality, Chris, and maybe this will be another podcast for the future is how in the world do I do I just sync that up with my payroll during a particular time? I mean, there's some practicality, some steps in the accounting world that my brain hasn't even started di- diving into that we can maybe do a podcast later on about. Yeah. But, um, you know, again, I, was, I asked that question, uh, John, just through the fact that if you've been uh, submitted your application, and you haven't been approved, it's my understanding you can pull it back. If you've submitted your application and now wondering, oh man, I didn't know I could include retirement benefits, group health benefits, uh, cafeteria benefits, uh, those those types of things, then you can pull it back. I pulled one back today because uh, one of my clients um, heard other advice and said, I need to run and get the money before it runs out. And they and they were working with their banker and they were both working earnestly in good faith together trying to do what was the right thing. And then I looked at the calculation. I'm like, you're leaving a lot of money on the table of what you can get for your business, for your employees. Right. Um, for your viability of your business. Um, and I talked to the banker today, said, hey, I'm going to pull it back and we're going to we're going to hold the grid and watch. Now, back to your other statement, John, if you have the money. Right. If you have the money already in your account. I would recommend at this time, not just to go put people back on payroll. I think there's probably going to be some guidance as to how this may have happened. But again, if it's going to be a loan, okay, if it's going to be a loan, it's going to be a liability because we might miss our eight week window, then at least keep the money for the business operations Mm -hmm. whenever you come back and going. So don't go out there and go, great, I got it. Now I got to put everybody on payroll 
until you we know when we're going back in the game, right? Because in my opinion, gotcha. the PPP was not there to subsidize the unemployment rolls. Okay. And dental is a lot different because we are closed down, down. Right. Um, but I think that you see a lot of commentators and posts and blogs and everything going, the PPP is here to get people off unemployment rolls. You can start paying them again while we get through this. No, this is PPP is there to get these businesses up and going when we start back. Cause when mm -hmm. a dental office has been shut down for four, six, eight weeks and you start on day one and start generating revenues again, you got payroll due in two weeks. How are you going to cover that? That's right. right. Mm -hmm. It's there to make sure you can bring all your team members back, pay them up you know, 75% to full benefits and keep them while you go through that transition of going back into operation is how I look at gotcha. it. Um, I think they may very well extend that 630. But if you've already got your money, if you've already got the money wired into your account because we ran and got it, hey, it is what it is. I think there may be some opportunities potentially to hopefully clarify it. You know, but that being said, hold it, put it in that other account that you have. If you do have it, if you don't put it in the bank and just let it sit there until we know further, further guidance. I think it's and good you just advice. Have to accept that you yeah. might have to accept that you might not get a lot of forgiveness on this, but at least you yeah. have the money and you There's do have some term. ability. Yeah. 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 That's right. So, so there are parts of our country, which I know dentists have not lost. Right. They're, they're really are. They're in rural America and they are just rocking and rolling right now. So in that particular case, if you have some damage, you may go ahead and apply at this point, depending on where your particular state location is. I think though, for the masses, what I would say as just some guidance is go ahead as that list that Chris just so beautifully articulated out there, go ahead and start working with your advisors to get that information, get it together and go ahead and prepare the loan document, be prepared, right? Right. Um, and then as you're as you yourself or as your advisors or as additional guidance is unveiled here in the next week, day, who knows, weekend, at that point, you you may apply sooner than later or you may delay. It, it, I think you can get prepared at this point and then trust your team. And ultimately, I, mean, I was talking with an individual yesterday and he said, Justin, my gut tells me. You know, and we always have that gut feeling sometimes, right? Listen to your gut, you know, listen to, listen, take the advice and then listen to your gut. At the end of the day, you know, your decision is in your camp. You're the business owner. There is an old saying that says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Solomon wrote that actual proverb out. And so you want to get the counsel of your advisors. But then at the end of the day, make the best decision. Uh, Donald Trump, I'm not trying to posture him in any way. I have mixed motions about the man many times, but he made this statement in one of his interviews years ago. He said, I'd like to collect as much information as I can, get prepared and delay my decision as long as possible. I think that is the most prudent advice that I can give at this point. Now, Chris, I bounced it to you to help answer that same question. No, I, I, I echo that completely. Uh, we, we're, in, we're in an unknown, right? And when you're dealing with the unknown, you don't want to run through the door, right? You want to, you want to, you want to look around, you want to walk through, you want to be uh, very observant to see, make sure that any of our steps that we make today don't hinder us moving forward, right? So I would echo and say, yes, get everything teed up, get it to your banker, make sure it's cool with their underwriting department, but hold the application. And then you hold it, just like Justin said, two things, when you need it, and if you don't need it and while you're closed down, you want to get these funds as close to the day you reopen. So these monies can be there to support your small businesses and your practices to come in and not limp along and have, you know, holes are hard to dig out of. They're easy to dig and they're hard to get out of. And this is there for these small businesses to start business day one, whether it's May 4th, June 5th, or July you know, 6th, right? Whatever the date is that we get back in the game, this is there. And I would recommend everybody utilize these funds strategically to make sure that you and your team can hit the ground running where you don't have to worry about, you know, any, you know, supplies. You don't have to worry about cash flow or capital. You don't have to worry about, you know, cutting employees pay or cutting employees, you know, or, or cutting your employee count later. It's going to give you a good two month run to get back and going, you know, getting that stability for your practice and your employees and their jobs. Gotcha. And that, I think that's a good uh, way to sort of sum things up, you know, that first off, take your time, <clears throat> you know, don't rush through this. 
and think about the potential upside of if you hit this right, um, what this can do for your business. You know, to get first off uh, closer to the time we're going to reopen, so that you can not only have the money uh, potentially forgiven. But also, the more we're going along with this, while there are changes being made, you don't want to get caught um, using the money for something that turns out down the road uh, wasn't exactly what it needed to be used for. You know, we were talking about this before the show that even people say, "Oh, well, if I get the money now, you know, to get, I'll first go ahead off, and you know, prepay uh, to the payroll time. costs or give people bonuses or something like that, so that I can get the forgiveness." But you know, is that going to be something that ends up getting disallowed? You know, as we go forward, because it wasn't exactly the idea behind it. And I think there's so many things right now that we don't know. And, and I think that, uh, this is good advice to kind of take home and say, all right, you know, talk with your advisors, um, you know, keep your head in the game, get everything ready. Uh, but see if we can time everything right to, uh, to hit it at the time when we're on the upswing, when you're going to need the most help that you probably ever needed to, uh, pay your payroll costs, especially because there's a real potential here. We may be working at least initially harder than we ever have to try to get these patients in right at the time that they've been backlogged for a couple months. Yeah. So let me just say a little bit about that is that it is unbelievable the amount of backlog that you're going to have. And we're going to, we're going to try to tackle that on a different show, but, um, John, I, I, I might send, I might go ahead and say what I sent you and Chris yesterday was we added up how many restorative hours. Now we're not talking about money. We're just talking about how much restorative hours on my schedule alone that's been moved through our deadline, uh, which is the end of April. So if we've, we've moved every patient to May 4th, we calculated just on my schedule, 180 hours scheduled 180 that is a month if you work a 40 hour week well, the average dentist works 32 hours a week right so mm -hmm. 32 into 180 what is that math justin you're the math whiz here i don't, yeah. know. Five, or six, I don't know five or six weeks five yeah, or six weeks there. worth of work that's five or six calculator. weeks of work yeah exactly so i mean like here's the thing is like how are you even going to do that, right? And so we want to talk a little bit about that on a on a future show about how to manage that schedule. We have some interesting ideas and uh, mm -hmm. some scheduling experts and that type of thing. I also want to say this: one thing is, you're going to need is money. One thing you're going to need is money. You're going to you know, need in money. order to. There's one thing that's going to be you're going to need more money for payroll than you probably ever have. And, Get ready and to so pay. That's overtime. why this is tough. <laughs> Yeah, that's why hey, this is so for a shameless to get the max. You for can. a shameless plug here, guys, I want to just tell you this that shameless. we've already shifted the podcast. Yeah, shameless, the shameless plug. We've already shifted the <laughs> Financial Simple podcast. Tomorrow, we're recording our very first episode. How do you turn around? Right. So I don't. You know, some of these practices. You, I don't like the term startup. Right. But that's in effect what it is. But it's technically a turnaround. You've, you've gone through it eh, and now you got to get it up fast. So there's actually an industry called turnaround change agents, turnaround agents that do this. And we're padding the podcast with those individuals who do this for a living turnaround podcast. Mm -hmm. So that's a shameless Good. plug. I'm sorry. I had to do that. You know, you're, you're going on our channel as well here streaming this. So I wanted to shout out to our peeps as well. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of questions are yeah, coming no, in even a, now. And and I think, you know, here's yeah. the thing is we'll have Justin and Chris jump on there. A lot of these questions that have came in just here at the last few minutes have been really good. And we've answered those, yeah. I think, throughout the show. So if you go back and rewatch the live stream, I appreciate those that have commented about the audio. We had a little issue with some feedback through uh, Facebook responses and things. And so I really appreciate that. That was corrected mm -hmm. within a couple minutes. And uh, if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't know those things. We're going to release this, John, in a audio format uh, coming up here very soon. Try to push that out by uh, tomorrow. And so if, if not, uh, if you don't see it there, you can just rewatch it on, uh, on Facebook right. or even go up on the YouTube channel. And one thing I would just say in kind of closing here, you know, we've had a theme over this last week in our podcast, which keeps coming up, which is the scarcity mindset versus the abundance mindset. And, you know, I hear it. It's really affecting dentists right now in every possible way. It's affecting our mental health. It's affecting our approach to these loan programs. It's affecting mm. our approach to coming back into our practice. And it's really 
a damaging thing. And I think that if we can shift our mindset from scarcity to abundance and think about what's possible mm. instead of things are going to run out, we're not going to have enough of this, we're never going to get back to where we were, we're not going to have enough, you know, and start to think about, okay, well, what if it turns out that actually the money is there? And what mm-hmm. if it turns out that, you know, I mean, think obviously plan for the worst, right? Definitely. But also try to think about what is possible because, man, everything we're hearing is just preying on this idea of scarcity. And I think if we can just kind of back up from that, man, I know my mental health has improved. The more I've heard from smart people who have kind of told me, you know what, like, it's going to be OK. Take it easy. Think more about what's possible. Um, I think that's something we could definitely take home and make us sleep a little bit better. Yeah. As we close out the show, uh, Chris, tell tell the listeners where you can be found and how they can reach out to you. Now, sure, they can go to our website, which is Mahan, M-A-H-A-N, associates.com, or they can email me directly at chris at Mahan, associates.com. We're all one big community here, you know, and we're all learning from each other. So if there's ever any questions, feel free to email me at any time because we're just one big mastermind group trying to figure out the best way to do this to make sure that practices are not only successful or turnaround, but they can come out of this likely better than they did coming into it. If you put, right, if yeah. you really think strategically with the quadrant two thinking and with the, all the things that you want to do to your practice and have subsidized funding from the federal government on multiple levels, and there's levels out there that we haven't even talked about past e- idle loans or PPP loans that we'll talk about after we get through some of this heartburn that it's going to be that the government's already allocated a mass amount of funds to help small business. This may be the time to explode. And I echo John's you know, comments that with that abundance mentality, I think that you can set your practice and your, you know, your patients and your staff up for a better practice than there was before we went into this. Awesome. Justin, where can uh, the listeners find out about you? So yeah, check out financiallysimple.com. That's the core, core of our of our hub. Um, we have the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere out that you want to look to, Financially Simple. Um, so I would say, say go there or you can find me on my public page, Justin Goodbread. It's a public profile, so you just go in there and follow it. You can. We're trying to do our best. Chris has been on the show several times as well. We're trying to get all this information out. We've had a lot of smart people, a lot of smart people come into the channel and try to try to give some very good guidance, some some abundance mentality. I, I'm, a, I'm the same belief, John, that, that it's now abundance mentality more than ever. You know, like I've said here recently on my show, consistently friends is this, and I want to leave you this last little bit of hope that the sun will come up tomorrow, barring the Lord's return. The sun will come up tomorrow, just like it did today. But if you look at the goodness that we all have, I've heard more than once this last week, I've heard people say, I played kickball with my kids. The, the, mm. the, the world of sports is not there anymore. I watched the leaves bud on every tree around my house. I've never done that before. Mm. I was able to have dinner with my family for the last three to four weeks. So we have in this moment a pause. I call it a selah moment. If you've ever read any of scripture, use a selah. Take a moment and just breathe and decompress. And now in the dental community more than ever, breathe. Because as soon as this thing kicks up in gear, you're going to be hustling. You're going to be a hamster on a, on a wheel. It's going to get at it. So make some memories right now. The sun will come up tomorrow. There is more goodness than badness around us. Sun will come up tomorrow and this too shall pass. So y'all keep your head up. Yeah, man, that's awesome. That's a great way yeah. to finish it out. I mean, I don't think it could get any better than Listen, that I thought think, process. Yeah, was. this is wonderful. I really appreciate these two guys coming on and I appreciate all the people that joined the live stream today and the feedback there has been fantastic. Um, we've got um, we've got a lot of stuff coming out for you guys, right? And if you haven't checked out um, our Facebook page, you need to check that out. Uh, we're also streaming live on YouTube as well. And uh, we're releasing this content as it comes available um, to us, to you. Um, we're going to try to do this financial update, John, I think on a, on a more consistent basis, but as time Mm -hmm. goes on, you're going to want more information and we'll try to kind of digest it behind the scenes, bring Chris and Justin back on. So I know you all appreciate that. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow, John, tell us a little bit about a special guest, some clinical stuff that you guys are going to love, John. Yeah, this is uh, obviously the financial side of it is what's stressing us all out, but it gives us an opportunity as we talk about breathing, taking a moment to bring people on that are going to help contribute to our education during this time. So as we've uh, continued to partner with Spear Education, we're going to have uh, Rebecca Bacow 
uh, on the show. And we've talked to uh, Becca before. She's a very, very high level orthodontist who talks a lot about airway, skeletal growth, some of the newest techniques of being able to uh, influence that and how that plays a role on our overall restorative treatment. And she's going to be on with us tomorrow uh, to talk about uh, some interesting things and developments, talking a little bit about the surgical connection with airway, talking about airway uh, development in kids, and just kind of giving us uh, some next level information. So I think you guys are going to love this. She is uh, at the top of her game, and we're really excited to have her on uh, tomorrow. So join Join us for the live stream that we'll be doing tomorrow right around uh, noon Eastern. Uh, it's been a great show once again. Thanks for everybody that participated today. Thanks to Chris and Justin. Uh, we'll be back with you tomorrow. So for Wes, I'm John. We are the Dental Guys.